Good morning, folks. Welcome to St. Matthew's. Uh, as you can see, I'm in a special place today. Um, I'm here doing these announcements from our uh, old building, our beautiful old sanctuary, not only so that you can see it once again, if it's been a little while since you've seen it, um, but also uh, because we've got a little bit of work happening over in the new building that's creating some noise. So I had to do a little bit of this over here today, and then some of it will also be, uh, we managed to, um, uh, to film over there in the, in the new building. So it'll be a little bit of a mishmash today, but that's okay. You get to see both of these lovely worship spaces that we have here at St. Matthew's. And speaking of which, just a reminder, we have restarted our Wednesday noon healing Eucharist. So Wednesdays at noon, um, it's a very small group. And uh, if you are interested in, in learning about the saints, uh, we, we always celebrate some saints from our calendar of saints. We have a, you know, a recognize some of those lesser feasts. Um, and we have prayers for healing and laying on of hands available. It's a, it's a Eucharistic service. So if you're interested in kind of an alternative option to a larger Sunday morning service for whatever reason, maybe that, that schedule doesn't work for you, you work on Sundays, you don't want to be in such a big crowd right now, whatever it is, uh, just know that we do have a Wednesday noon service available in this building, in this space. So if you've been missing that in your life and you're able to, um, to come out to that, just know that that is available as an option. Um, just in other news, a couple other announcements as we begin our worship this morning. I want to let you all know we have a Faith Formation Forum coming up uh, very shortly on Tuesday, July 27th, so just a couple days at 7 p.m. This is going to help us plan some of those Faith Formation events uh, in, the, in the coming uh, late summer and into the early fall. Uh, we're going to be putting a lot of those things on the calendar and uh, working through that together. So if you have an interest in that topic, uh, you are invited to come. Um, and you can reach out to uh, Father Colville and he'll send you the uh, Zoom info for that. Um, just another reminder, we are in the middle of a wonderful outreach project right now. We partner with Helen's Hope Chest. They're an incredible organization that does outreach to foster children here in the community. Uh, and so we, uh, there's some information about how to get involved with them, how to support them. We're going to be providing backpacks filled with school supplies that they'll be distributing to foster children here um, in, the, in the valley. And so they do an amazing work um, there. And I just really uh, uh, encourage your support of them now or any other time of year. We usually work with them in the summer in that back to school period and at Christmas time. We uh, provide gifts for those children at Christmas. And so that's just a, an awesome community partner that we have here at St. Matthew's. Just another reminder, we are also having uh, Wednesdays, a lot of things happening. I mentioned the Wednesday Noon Healing Eucharist. Also from 9 to 11 a.m., we're having that coffee and conversation group. There's no agenda, uh, nothing other than just an opportunity for fellowship together and some coffee. That happens at 9 a.m. on Wednesdays over in Matt's Cafe. Um, and you'll also find a couple announcements about some other opportunities in the community, some other things regarding our uh, youth and children's programming. Um, I just want to tell you what a joy and a privilege it is to have you here with us at St. Matthew's, worshiping with us from wherever you might find yourself physically. Um, you are part of what makes this community special, and we're so glad you're here. Let's just take a moment to center ourselves, uh, hear the voice of the Spirit in our hearts and minds as we begin our service this morning. Thank you, and God bless.
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong and nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from 2 Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. 
Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord. But he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, so that he may be struck down and die. The Word of the Lord. Please join me in reading Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All are corrupt and commit abominable acts. There is none who does any good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all to see if there's any who is wise. If there's one who seeks after God, everyone has proved faithless. All alike have turned bad. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all those evildoers who eat up my people like bread and do not call upon the Lord? See how they tremble with fear, because God is in the company of the righteous. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice and Israel be glad. A reading from Ephesians. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And I know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church <laughs> and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because 
they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Just 12 miles southeast of Portland, Oregon, you'll find a small town where everything, and I mean everything, is boring. The library is boring, the city hall is boring, even the fire department, it's boring. And that's not an insult, that's just the way things are. You would find if you walked the streets in this small town or cruised down the many roads that ramble through the country around it, dozens of berry farms, small family ranches, and beautiful trees and plants grown by arborists. It really is a lovely little town. All of it, though, and I mean all of it, is boring. And that's because the town itself carries that name. This lovely community of 7,000 people with gorgeous views of Mount Hood is, in fact, Boring, Oregon. The locals have really leaned into the name. The town council even adopted a snappy slogan to boost tourism, Boring, Oregon, the most exciting place to live. I have to admit, that's pretty good. Boring is not named because of the lack of things to do. In fact, quite the contrary. It turns out that the town's founder was one William H. Boring, a Union soldier who fought at the Siege of Vicksburg during the Civil War, and as soon as he got out of the army, decided to head west, perhaps hoping for a little less excitement in his life, ironically enough. The Boring family set up a farm on a patch of land near Portland and eventually donated land for the community school, which is how Boring, Oregon got its name. For about a century and a half, this little town slumbered in obscurity until about a decade ago when a woman from Scotland was passing through Oregon on a cycling trip and she was immediately drawn to Boring because she was well acquainted with, are you ready for this? the town of Dull, Scotland. Dull, just so you know, was probably derived from an ancient Pictish word, 
But regardless of where the name comes from, the town folks were thrilled to discover that they were not alone in the pejorative town name department. It took less than a year for Boring and Dull to declare themselves official sister cities. When Dull and Boring joined themselves in this sort of civic matrimony, word began to spread. And this is totally irrelevant, but do towns with strange names have like their own Facebook group or something? How are they communicating with one another? But I digress. Regardless of how it happened, the word got out, and in 2013, the town of Bland, Australia demanded to join the club. Bland, Australia was named after a transported convict named William Bland, a 19th century surgeon with a penchant for dueling his rivals, which is what got him sent down under. The result is that Boring, Oregon, Dull, Scotland, and Bland, Australia have formed something called the League of Extraordinary Communities to promote tourism and presumably sell lots of t-shirts and coffee mugs. As I say this today, we're waiting to hear if any other towns will join this extraordinary league, such as Tedious California or Snooze Fest, Georgia. Okay, I, I made those last two up. What do you think makes a place special or exciting or interesting? Is it because of the name? Is it because of the features and the attractions? Is it because of natural beauty? Is it because of what happened there in the past? We go and visit famous places for all of those reasons, don't we? And you know, so often I think we hear names, famous place names, like the ones in the gospel this morning, and we envision something otherworldly, sacred, like something out of a painting illustrated by a Renaissance artist who had never actually been there. For many of us, the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, Nazareth, these are places that exist only in our imagination, only in that rarefied light of the daydream, only with a storybook gloss of an ancient Bible story. But let me tell you something, Nazareth is real and ordinary and commonplace as anywhere else. It has restaurants, car dealerships, and furniture stores. It has traffic and congestion and pollution. It is as real and as ordinary as any place that you have ever lived. Nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth was apparently the end joke in Jesus' own day. And if the Messiah had been from Bakersfield or Baltimore, we would probably roll our eyes just as much as those ancient Israelites did about a savior from Nazareth. Commonplace, humdrum, every day. Nobody wrote ancient Lonely Planet guides to Nazareth. Rick Steves wouldn't have let any tours there. Likewise, the Sea of Galilee may be one of the most oversold places on planet Earth. For all the hype, Galilee is just a lake and not an especially big one. If you've ever stood on the shores of Lake Ontario or Lake Michigan, that Sea of Galilee won't impress you much. It's certainly a beautiful area, still a bit wild and bucolic 2,000 years after Jesus walked there, but it's no more interesting than the Finger Lakes of Western New York where I spent my college years. Capernaum, for all the ink spilled about the synagogue there and for all the hubbub about St. Peter, its most famous resident, Capernaum is just a small fishing village, long abandoned to time and overtaken with weeds. All that remains now is a small ruin of a town, and the cramped parking lot regularly welcomes a half dozen tour buses whose drivers inevitably smoke cigarettes and gossip while their charges explore what little remains of this famous place. I could say similar things about any number of other places named in scripture. They're just places locations like any other. And this leads me to a certain conclusion, that it's not the place itself that's important, but it's the people who live there, the people animated and led by the Holy Spirit who did God's will. That's what matters. It's not the land itself that's holy, it's God that makes it that way. It's not the ground that's holy, but the God who created it who is holy. It's not the dirt itself that leaves us in awe and wonder, but the spirit that moves in us. Moses doesn't take off his sandals on holy ground because the sand itself was somehow sanctified. He did that because the spirit of the Lord had lit up his heart and soul and was there blazing right in front of him. You know, stained glass, 
is often theological. And I'm especially proud of this incredible glasswork you see on either side of me. It's not just because it's beautiful, but because of what it represents. Jesus, the good shepherd, is shown with a flock of sheep and goats. But the desert he stands in is not the desert of Midian or the hills of Galilee. It's our desert, the Sonoran. The plants are the ones that you see and know. The animals are ones that live right here in these hills, in this desert, in this sacred place. The message of these windows and the message that I want you to know and to see and to internalize each and every time you see them is that God is and can be present anywhere and everywhere. Scripture says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. No distance, no height, no depth. God has created this world and loves it enough to redeem it, even when it, even when we, sin against him. A place is not holy in and of itself. Honestly, that's a kind of idolatry. Places are sacred because of their creator, because of their redeemer, and because of their sanctifier. Places are sacred because of the way God's power was made known there. That's the message, that's the incredible message of this reading from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians this morning. It's a message about how God's power is capable of anything and sanctifies all that it touches and creates. I bow my knees before God, Paul says, because everything we see exists because of God. Everything we can see, touch, taste, smell, God created it. I bow my knees before God and ask for what? For power. I pray, Paul says, that God may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. And again, that you may have the power to comprehend. We need God's power to comprehend God's glory because God is above and beyond all things, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. We need that power even to know the love of Christ, St. Paul says, because that love surpasses knowledge. It surpasses knowledge. It's beyond our ability to grasp because it is beyond anything we have experienced or even dreamed of. It's not something we can reason our way to, think our way to. It's something that God's power through the Holy Spirit teaches our hearts. But even more incredibly, Scripture tells us that that power is working in us too. God's power is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. More than we can ask and more than we can even imagine. That power works in us through the grace of Jesus Christ. It's a power that helps us to know the love of Christ to invite the Spirit into our hearts, to learn to let go of our sin and accept our redemption, to give ourselves to the embrace of a loving God. As a baptized people, as a people of faith, you are united with Christ. And I can tell you today that this place that we live in, this place can be just as holy, just as sacred, just as spirit-filled as any holy land ever was. We may think the place we live in is boring or dull or bland, but nothing could be further from the truth. Just like those places, with the right kind of eyes, we can see that God makes this place extraordinary. And I'm convinced that any place, the most humble home, the most simple dwelling, a trailer park, and a lemonade stand, any place where God is worshipped in spirit and in truth can be a sacred place. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit in this wonderful and sacred land. Let us live that reality and that truth. Let us love God, love our neighbors, and by God's power, make this place holy. Holy Lord, today we know, we know by faith that your power working in us can do more than we can ask or even imagine. 
And so, Lord, today we ask you to work in us and through us. Let your Holy Spirit overwhelm us. Reveal to us the truth and the knowledge of your Christ. And lead us to that kingdom that you have prepared for us from the foundation of the world. In your holy name, amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Gracious God, we pray for your holy Catholic church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth, with all peace. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Inspire our witness to our Lord Jesus Christ, that all may know the power of his forgiveness and the hope of the resurrection. Lord, give us grace to be your servants in the church. O oh Lord, our Governor, bless all the leaders of our land, that we may be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. Grant to all in administrative authority wisdom and grace in the exercise of their duties. Lord, keep this nation under your care. O oh, Heavenly Father, who has filled the world with beauty, open our eyes to see your gracious hand in all your works. We ask for seasonable weather with life-giving moderate rain. Increase our reverence before the mystery of life. Grant us wisdom and compassion in the care of this world. Lord, rejoicing in your whole creation, may we learn to serve you with gladness. O oh God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth to confront one another without hatred or bitterness and work together with mutual forbearance and respect. 
Lord, break down the walls that separate your children and unite us in bonds of love. Almighty and most merciful God, we remember before you the homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. We remember those who are in prison of mind or body, and those who suffer from injustice, and those who live in fear. Lord, help us to heal those who are broken in body or spirit, and turn their sorrow into joy. Father of all, we pray for all those we love but see no longer. Grant them eternal rest with all your saints in your heavenly kingdom. Let light perpetual shine upon them. Lord, may the souls of all the departed, through your great mercy, rest in peace. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, and that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen.
The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opens to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care, that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus, born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in one bread.
friends, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks Thank be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. 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 There is a candle in every soul Some brightly burning, some dark and cold There is a spirit who brings a fire Ignites a candle and makes his home Carry your candle Been right.